I'm very, very happy to be here uh, today to show you some of the very cool features that we've been working for two years, and now they are so close to being out there. Some of the features that I'm going to show, they've already been presented at some of the um, previous sessions, but they are so cool that I want to make sure none of you miss them, because there are so many parallel sessions. So I'm going to try to do a, a quick tour through the features that I've considered most relevant. There are many more that, that are missing, but those that I've considered most relevant uh, for you. So let's get started. And yesterday, uh, in, the, in the opening keynote, Brian Song laid out our product vision. Right? And our product vision can be defined in three sentences. First is we want Library to be a great platform for building web and mobile digital experiences. But we also want those experiences to be engaging. And we want them to uh, understand the user. We want you, as running those experiences, to be able to understand the user. And as part of that, we need to be able to go with the user through the whole journey. Uh, of your interactions or of his interactions with your services, with your companies. So let's take a look about, about uh, let's take a look at the features that we've been creating, we've been adding for Library 7 related to each of these uh, aspects of, of our vision. And let's just start with creating web and mobile uh, digital experiences. First of all, the way webs are has changed dramatically in the last few years, and we've realized that. And actually, some of you uh, have already been using Library to create amazing modern websites. But we want to make it so easy that anyone, with as little effort as possible to save time, to save money, can create these awesome, stunning modern websites. So one of the things that we've realized that could help you achieve this is that Library out of the box provides more themes and more site templates that look much more like these modern sites that I'm, that I'm talking about. So let's take a look at uh, some of them. For example, this is one of the site templates and themes that we are shipping with. It's a corporate site. And as you can see, it has very little to do with the type of sites that we saw five years ago. A second example is a product page. This is the type of page that uh, is most commonly created nowadays to present a product. A third example is a much more unique site. It's a site that is meant to be creative. And as you can see, it has a lot of images. It has a lot of visual content. And a fourth theme that we're shipping with is for creating digital media. And again, you can see that this is probably a little bit in between the last two. And this is going to be shipped out of the box so that you can create sites like this, or very similar like this, because you have a very good starting point to create stunning sites. So. As we were building this, we've also learned a lot ourselves. And we've also been hearing uh, from those uh, of you who have already been creating this type of sites. And we've added a bunch of features that are specifically designed to make it easier to build this type of sites, and not only to build them, but to make it easier to maintain. And I'm going to show you a few of them, um, but there are many more under the hood. For example, one of the things we've realized is uh, the way Library uh, can be built uh, by combining blocks or uh, widgets. Uh, it started from the very first portals that came out. And to a certain degree, we've, we've inherited many of the ways that, that they were built. With, for example, a portlet uh, widget, whatever you call it in your installations, they usually have a box. So we've rethought that concept of a box, and we've made it so that it's possible for themes to define the several ways in which that box can be shown or not. And that's very helpful. This is just four examples, very simple in this case, but they can get much more advanced, so that a site administrator, when adding a content or when adding an application, can choose what the decoration around it is. We've also made it so that the applications, the content that could be in the theme uh, that usually were not configurable can now be completely configurable. And you can see as examples the navigation or the search uh, that is now included out of the box. And you can see how you can access the configuration. And uh, you can see here that there is a preview that's, that's uh, probably familiar for you if you've been administering Library. And you can choose whatever uh, look and feel you want for the navigation. And without having to change the theme, without having to ask a developer to change it, uh, the site administrator can easily change that look and feel. Creating content. 
In several of the sessions uh, that you may have attended, we've been insisting how to create great web experiences, content is key. And because of that, we want to make uh, it as easy as possible for authors to focus on their content. And our web content administration was one of those tools in which, because we have so many options, which is great, right? Because sometimes you need them. But it was also a little bit um, even scary for some authors. And actually, we, we have several customers who have simplified it. So we've worked really hard. We've integrated uh, tools such as Alloy Editor, which you may have already heard of. And if not, I'll do it in a few minutes. Uh, and we al we'll allow authors to really focus on their content and only show the right features when they need them. Okay? We've also made life easier for those people uh, reviewing content. This is an example of one of those features, which is the difference viewer. So that if you are uh, authorizing, if you have to review uh, content that has been modified, you can easily and visually see what the differences are or check other versions or previous versions to compare the differences. We also have new localization capabilities. It's happening more and more that library sites are created uh, for international contexts in which the same site needs to be uh, in several languages. Um, Library has very good support for that, and we've just identified a few key places where it was still not possible to uh, localize the content. And three things that we've added is uh, email-based notifications that can be localized, better support for RTL languages. Previously, we already supported this based on what the browsers provide. We were just following the standards. But now we've gone one step further, and it's, uh, the platform itself also supports RTL languages. Approval workflow. So, and I have two friends uh, that you may have met if you attended my presentation yesterday. But basically, it's uh, something that has been asked by several customers, and we've added to Library 7, which is starting with 6.2, any user, usually an administrator, can subscribe uh, or, or determine that they want to review the um, content that is in web content, for example, all web content or all documents and media. What we've done in this version is that you can be much more specific. And for example, you could say something such as, I want the events team to be able to review all the images that are uploaded to this folder that we've created to put folders of the North American Symposium. Right? And you can do that. You can just say, whatever you put in this folder is going to be reviewed by that team. But not only that, maybe you want uh, to review a certain type of document, for example, a press release, independently of what it is. And you can also say that. You can, I, you can also say may, the, the peer team wants to review all press releases, which is just yes, a document type in this case, and make sure that it goes through them before we consider them final and publishing them. Okay. Another really cool feature is related to geolocation, to mapping. There are several portals already built with Library that are using geolocation, and we wanted to incorporate it in the product out of the box. So how does this work? Very easy. Simply for web content, for documents, for anything that is based on our underlying forms um, framework, you can define a field or several. And then when the user edits, that uh, document, web content, etc. This is an example of editing an image uh, that is part of our documents and media. You will have that field, and you will have a pretty uh, location selector that, as you can see here, in this example, it's using Google Maps. There are also other providers. Uh, and you can directly, in a map, select where you are. You can change the selection, or you can even enter manually the address that you want, because it doesn't have to be where you are. But if you are, for example, using mobile, like in this example, you can actually use the mobile geolocation features to geolocate your content very easily. And not only that, once you have this content, we also wanted to make, make it super easy uh, for you to publish it. So we've used one of the Swiss Army Knives tools that Library has for site administrators, asset publisher. For those of you who are not familiar with Asset Publisher, it's a very powerful tool that basically allows you to create a list 
of any content that can be created through Liferay, either out of the box or even custom content. So Asset Publisher allows you to, or allows a site administrator to say, I want to see all the latest web content that has been created, all the latest documents, all the documents that has been flagged as highlighted, all the documents that have this specific category, ordered this way. It's very, very powerful. What we've added on top of it is we've added a template that actually you can modify and customize so that that content, instead of being shown in a list, instead of being shown uh, in any of the several ways that are provided out of the box, can be provided as a map. And this is an example, uh, a real world example, of showing the pictures that are associated to a given event and having uploaded to a folder, just like in, a, in the example I was mentioning in the previous slide, and it's being shown in a map because they are being geolocated through one of these new fields. Very cool, right? Okay, I've been talking about web and mobile experiences, but so far I've been focusing mainly on web experiences. What have we done for, for mobile experiences? We've already had some sessions and even a workshop where we've been providing some details, but I wanted to quickly explain for those of you who have not attended those sessions and remind you for those who have, some of the cool tools that we've been improving and creating over the, over the past two years. So first of all, the tool that has been around for a longer time, the mobile SDK, that allows mobile developers, native mobile developers, to connect to Liferay for getting about the basic stuff that Liferay provides out of the box. On top of that, we've built Liferay screens, which is higher level, which provides you widgets that are already connected to Liferay. You don't even need to know much about Liferay to use a screenlet. Uh, screens, and then you can much, much quicker build native experiences. And then we've recently added uh, a new feature on top of this, which is library push, which is really, really powerful for engaging users because it allows uh, an application to actively, proactively tell something to the user. And these are just tools, right? And you can say, okay, this is, this is a tool but you are talking about an experience, right? This, this is not an experience. So we wanted to showcase uh, what it is to create a real mobile experience, a digital experience with a mobile, uh, through a mobile interface for real. So what is the best way to do that? The best way to do that is to create a retail store. So welcome, Library Apparel. Yeah. And this is our star salesman, who is also a software engineer, so he may not be able to judge your size. Um, but otherwise, he does a great job. And if you have not been to our great new store, the grand opening is in this event, and it's in the next room, so you should go see it. And Library Apparel is, is a great example of a digital experience. It's an example of how a shop like this could actually uh, perform uh, or go through a digital transformation. And basically what we've done is use Liferay to create a web experience, but that is also available for mobile using Liferay's out-of-the-box uh, responsive capabilities. That's pretty awesome. But we've also used these three tools that I just mentioned, mobile SDK, screens, and Liferay push, to create a mobile application. And this mobile application, it's pretty cool because it's able to show the exact same content that it's in the website with very little effort. And not only that, it also uses library push to do very cool stuff. This application has a wallet, and that wallet can have coupons. And one of the very cool features that you will be able to see if you go to this store is how, as the user is walking through the store, as the user approaches some pair of shoes that he may be interested in, he may also get a notification saying, hey, you have a coupon. Don't think about it anymore. Right? It's really, really cool. So we've talked about creating these digital experiences for web and mobile. But we also want to talk about how, how can we engage and understand users. And this is actually something really hard. It's actually something that is very specific to the specific needs. But we've i uh, been working on identifying some of the features that are um, very general, and we want to add them 
to the, to the product. So I wanted to highlight uh, two specific examples. They are not big, splashy examples, but they are good examples of some small but relevant things that we can do or that you can do to make it easier for people to or for your users to engage with your digital experiences. And the first of them is, uh, as part of optimizing interactions, uh, one of the most common interactions, if you want your users to be part of your site, is writing comments. And what we realize is that depending on the interface to create comment, you can really encourage them, or people will just go away. So we've made it very, very simple to create comments, and the result is actually a very nice experience where you can even follow conversations, which was not that easy before. So this is one example. And if you've paid attention while this video was, was adding a comment, we've also added a new feature that also affects comments, and that is mentions. And what we found out is that mentions can really engage users much more. This is an example if, in blogs, so comments is not the only place. And imagine you are writing a blog entry, an author is writing a blog entry, and he just wants to mention a user. So this is, enga this is engaging in two ways. First of all, just by mentioning that user, that user is going to get a notification that he's been mentioning that comment in that blog entry in this case. But not only that, the name of the user quickly becomes a link, immediately, well, not quickly, immediately becomes a link to the profile of that user, encouraging the readers of that uh, blog entry to go to that profile page, and usually we'll have some ways of interacting with, with that user. It's two small examples, but that we've realized they can really make a difference, right? But this is just the beginning. We're working on much more, and Ed Song is going to talk a little bit more about how not only we want to encourage engagement, but we want to be able to measure it to see what actions we need to take. Another part of engaging your users, and I was talking a little bit about this before, is the authoring experience, right? So one of the key technologies that we've developed in these past two years is Alloy Editor. If you were in Chema's session, uh, which was fairly technical, but it still showed many cool features, you are probably already amazed by Alloy, Alloy Editor. How many of you were attending that session? Cool. What did you think? Okay. Not loud enough again, guys. <laughs> Come on, you can do better. Yeah. So I'm not going to show all the features, but Alloy Editor is basically uh, a new inline editing, uh, editor that is being used by library sportlets and that can be also used by, by yours. And I'm going to show you just a sneak peek of what it allows uh, authors to do. So basically, this is the typical way that most content management systems, if not all, usually uh, provide to allow an author to enter rich content, right? And basically, the problem with this is that you have this big toolbar. And not only that, because it's so big, whenever you, can, you think, oh, I want to add another feature or another, and oh, wow, actually, CK Editor, this is CK Editor, which is the most popular, but TinyMC, which is the second most popular, is almost the same. You want to add more buttons, but the more buttons you add to add even more features, the uglier it becomes, and the less you can focus on the content. How many of you, of you have read the content? Nobody, right? Because all the, all the UI for the editor is getting in the way. So let's forget about toolbars. This is what a Loi editor looks like. Basically, you have the content. You highlight a, content, a piece of content that you want to operate in, and then you see the actions that you can do in that specific piece of content. It's in-context toolbars. It's really, really cool. Let's see another example. And this example is actually Chema taking a picture of himself. Let's try to see that again. Basically, there is a plus button next to whatever your cursor is, and that allows you to add things to that place in the editor, right? In this case, there are several options, but he's choosing one option that allows you to take a picture with your camera, which is really cool. But even um, less cool things are really easy just by, just by pressing that plus button, and then you see what things you can insert. It's not hidden among many buttons in the toolbar. One of the places where we are leveraging a Loy Editor is blogging. And we've actually picked blogging 
because it's one of the uh, applications that we actually control the whole experience. And we don't want just to improve blogging, but pro uh, make it become an example of great authoring and publishing experience. So this is the new way uh, the blogs looks. This is a list of blog entries. This is how a blog entry would look like, one specific blog entry. So it's much more modern, much more um, pretty, I would say. But what is even cooler is how editing is. Right? This is the published blog entry, and this is editing it, editing it. I've removed the image, otherwise it would be shown there, just so that more content is, is shown. And in here, we can see that Alloy Editor is in place. This doesn't look like a form, does it? Because we don't want it to look like a form. Because if it looks like a form, then you are distracting the author. Okay? And it can also be done uh, in, in mobile. So the authoring experience in mobile is often very bad. But, so we wanted to make sure that the authoring experience for blogs, but also using blogs as an example of how it can be applied even to your own developments, can be really, really good. Okay. More and more, we are seeing that uh, images and all sorts of media are very important in this content that authors are creating. And the tools were not, they, they were not good enough. They were not good enough in library. They were not good enough in almost any content management system. So we've created a new um, image selector, which is much more than an image selector, but I'm just going to focus on, on the image selector uh, aspect of it. And whenever you want to add an image, whatever it is in library, you're going to be shown something like this. And there are several things that I want to highlight here. First is, if what you're selecting are images, what you most probably want to see are images. And big enough so that you can actually judge which is the one that, that you want to select. So this view is optimized for the type of media that you want to select. Not only that, we've integrated a very powerful search that has been greatly improved in library. Uh, so that you can actually search uh, all of your images based on the metadata that, that those images have. But what is even cooler is this concept that you can see as tabs here of having different image sources. What does that mean? That basically means that not only you can have authors pick images from your local installation, you may also have an images repository or you can connect to uh, other images, images repository. So let's, let's look at it with a, with a video. Okay, so I select an image, and you can see how there is blog images. There is a repository just for blogs that is new. You can select for documents and media. You can just enter a URL of an image. You can upload it from your local computer. Or look at this. This is an example of implementing integration with Anesplus, which is a royalty-free repository of images. And not only you can list them, but you can actually search, because Anesplats provides search functionality. And you can search for a dog, for example, because you really, really needed a dog in your blog entry. You preview it. Yeah, that's exactly what you wanted. And then you just add it to your blog entry. Okay. There you go. It's been automatically uploaded for you. And once the blog entry is, is saved, then it's also published along with the blog entry. Very nice. But adding an image is just part of it. But one of the things that we're seeing is authors are most commonly not so um, knowledgeable about editing tools. Probably they won't even have them installed. The browsers have improved a lot in the past few years. And one of the cool new features that allow doing is it's doing things such as editing an image. So starting with Library 7, we are going to ship with an image editor. So any image that is uploaded in library can be edited, and you can apply several very interesting features that will allow authors, with a, the need for having a tool installed, to edit the image. So you can, for example, add filters. That's very useful, especially if you're a bad photographer like me, because with a filter, your bad picture becomes a good picture. Nice. You can also do typical um, functions, such as adjusting brightness, and of course, you can transform the image by cropping, rotating, etc. Very cool, very cool tool. Thank you. So I'm very glad you liked it. And if you liked it, one other tool that you're really going to like is the new form designer. 
the new form designer basically makes it much easier to create advanced forms for LifeRay. So let's take a look at how it looks like. Basically, we go to the new tool, Forms. We create a new form. You can see a log editor under the hood here. And then I just create a page, some description, and I'm going to add a field. This is very fast. but uh, So you just create a question, and look at this. There are columns, and this field has something very cool, which is oh, this other field, that <laughs> so fast. It's required. You can enable validation, and you can say that it's an email. And there are many other options in there. What is even cooler is that you can create several pages. The form can create several pages. And we've actually done a lot of usability studies to show how multi-form pages will, uh, are usable. And first of all, you can see that uh, this is the form published. You can see two pages there. And well, it's so fast, sorry. <laughs> So even if the video <laughs> finished. One of the really cool features is that um, not only you can use this form and publish in a library site, in a specific library page, but you can even just share the form by itself. You can just say, just like if you've used uh, Google Docs and you, you, you've used the forms in Google Docs, it's the exact same experience. You can just create a form and you want to share it with a group of people by email or in whatever way you want, and you just want a URL that you can give to those users, and they will just have that forms experience and not uh, be distracted by anything else. That's one of the cool features that, that the new forms has. OK, and so far, uh, we've been talking about features because that's what this presentation is about. But I cannot avoid talking a little bit about some architectural improvements. Okay? And Library 7 allows developing modular applications. And not only that, more than ever, it allows adapting this platform for your needs. So I'm just going to mention very few things, because there, there has been more sessions about this so far, and there is going to be even more. If you were not in my session yesterday, because there were other super interesting sessions at the same time, you should definitely know after this event that Library is a microservices platform. But not any type of microservices, but in VM microservices that has many advantages, uh, especially in terms of the cost of developing them. What does this mean? Well, basically, it means that you can develop much more modular features, much more modular services, and deploy them live on LifeRay. You can connect them, and you can reuse them much more than ever before. What are the goals that we had with this? First of all, we want to help you shorten the development cycles. We also want you to. Uh, have, or we want to help you uh, release assets, release specific releases uh, that don't not only uh, take less time, but they can be as small or as big as you want. And at the end, what we want is to simplify the development on top of a platform like LifeRay. Okay. Another really cool feature that we have in LifeRay 7 allows optimizing the perceived performance of applications. You know that at Library, we've always been uh, very concerned with performance. We've worked really hard to improve the performance of the platform itself. Uh, and we wanted to take a step further. And basically, the step further is it's not only the performance of the backend, but it's whatever the user perceives. Right? And what we've learned uh, is that actually, performance is not just something that you can measure in bytes and seconds by you know, doing some load testing of your server. That is very important. But it's not only that. If the user perceives that it's very slow, for example, because after getting the data, they see a loading screen for several seconds, then that's bad. right? Uh, so how can this be improved? The most used technique is, is known as single page application, which is basically an evolution of what several years ago was called Ajax and has evolved much more into this concept of single page application. So how many of you have developed single page applications? Quite a few, right? Like 15 to 20%. And one thing you, you know when you have developed single page applications is that it basically changes the way you develop the UI of your application. In fact, if you have existing applications, you need to rewrite the UI of them. 
And, and then you need to choose a framework. There are very, very good frameworks out there. I know many of you are using Angular. Uh, lately, many people are starting to use React. Uh, for those that don't want to uh, be tied to one specific framework, Sena.js, uh, which we also created, is becoming also very, very popular. Those tools are great. And if you have the knowledge and the resources and you can create your UI from scratch, they're awesome. But how about the rest of us? How about the rest of the applications? So we've been thinking, how can we, as a platform developer, improve that situation? And basically, what we've done is this very cool technology that makes Library 7 automatically, with a single line change, convert any portlet, any existing portlet, into a single page application. So basically, if it already ran like a very fast car, now it's going to feel like an airplane. How do we do that? Well, that's a secret. <laughs> now, this is an example, um, a real example, that the team working on this created, which is, what does this mean? What does what this perceived performance uh, look like in a real world? So they created a page. They added two portlets to it. If there were more portlets, the effect would be magnified even more. And then they measured. They measured uh, with a mobile phone, because that's uh, one place where the perceived performance is especially important. And basically, they found that from two seconds, it went to 0 0.7 seconds. And this may seem not a lot, although actually it's a very big uh, improvement. But think that this is a simple page. But not only that, not only look at the, at the seconds. Look at the data transfer. From 1.3 megabytes to 67 kilobytes, that's very, very important in mobile context, where data is actually very relevant. And actually, it can make the speed even smaller if at a given point uh, of time, the data speed is, is very low. And one other thing that is, that is very relevant, and even if it's a little bit more technical, is how we've been able to reduce the number of requests from 42 before applying this SPI technology to 11 requests. Very cool. So this has been applied to all of the out-of-the-box portlets, and it will be applied to your portlets if they don't already use an SPI technology when deployed on Library 7. And if you're interested in learning more about this secret that I didn't tell you about, there is a session uh, at 1.40 PM at Denver uh, about how we've built this technology and other techniques to build single page applications. One other feature that has not been mentioned in any session is Library 7 is going to be more configurable than ever. And if you are building applications, there is a new framework that allows your applications with very little effort to become configurable. And that configuration, um, not, not only it's easy for you to code, but you're going to get a UI for free. This is a new UI that, that we auto-generate. It's called uh, System Settings. Internally, we also call it Configuration Admin, in case you've heard about it. And this, it's completely auto-generated from all the services that are automatically, uh, that are um, configured, uh, configurable in Liferay. And there are two things that I wanted to highlight about this tool. First is that it allows hot chains without restarting the server of many, many things that previously required a server restart in Liferay. But not only that, it allows also for something that is very, very, uh, very common request, which is to be able, for anything that is configurable, including, for example, a portlet that has been added to a page, to change the default configuration so that whenever a site administrator adds it to a page, they get not the default configuration that comes with Library or that you've had to add in a configuration file, but whatever this, the portal administrator has set in this tool. It's really, really powerful. So this was a quick tour through the features that, that we have in Library 7. There are many more. But we've been talking a lot about modularity in this event. And modularity is going to be great for you. You can trust me on that. But it's also great for us. It's already be, being great for us. And that's why I know it will be great for you. And one of the things that it's going to allow us to do is it's going to allow us to ship features much faster to you. We don't need to wait for a big release. But speaking of big releases, there is one question in the audience. Right? What is the question? 
Wow, I didn't hear anything. <laughs> when is it coming out? When is coming out? When is, when is Library 7 coming out? Okay? So this is the Library 7 timeline. Okay? So Library 7 is going to come out in Q1 of next year. Those of you that are following uh, our blogs uh, have already uh, probably downloaded the alphas. We're going to release a new one this week, actually. And we are already giving it the final touches. One of the things we're really focusing on in this release, apart from all these features, uh, all their architectural improvements that we've been talking about is quality. We really want Library 7 to be very high quality from the very beginning. A few weeks afterwards, uh, after running our typical security and performance improvements, we will release the enterprise subscription. And the thing that I wanted to highlight in terms of features, since we are talking about features, is that this is not the end of the picture. That during 2016 and the next of the years, we will continue releasing features as modules, as apps in our marketplace that will improve and will keep improving all the features that you've seen and that you're already using from Liferay. So just to wrap up, if you want to think of Liferay as of what are the great improvements, if you've attended the sessions here, you'll know that there are great architectural improvements. But not only that, we have around 500 new features and improvements. And you know, it's so easy to say 500. I could have said 400, right? Or 600. You wouldn't know, right? <laughs> yeah. Except that I don't like that, right? Because we, we really want to be, to be honest at Liferay. So once you download this application, you'll see that this is actually a link. And I've actually been very careful to make sure that this is real. I worked uh, one day with uh, one of our project managers to try to get rid of everything that is really not a feature or an improvement, some developer-oriented improvements. And we actually came up, oh, wow, it's increased. It's now 618. But it's OK. You can remember 500, because maybe even if we did this big effort, there are some things that are very developer-oriented. So this is for real. Tons of improvements in Liferay. Uh, let me see if I can find my cursor back. We don't want to just exaggerate. So I hope you liked it. Thanks a lot. <laughs>